So uh, in our uh, next session, we always do the session as part of our uh, virtual conference. Uh, I am always excited for it. Uh, it is about AI and ML platforms. We have an excellent, fantastic panel. I know all three of these gentlemen really well. So thank you, all of you. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for coming and thank you for participating in our uh, uh, conference. And uh, so let's just kick this off. Maybe each of you can spend like two or three minutes introducing yourself uh, and telling us a little bit about uh, you know how uh, how you've been. Uh, kind of involved in the AI ML space, we can do alphabetically if that makes sense. So that will be Alan, Miguel, and Jishuan. Z. Hopefully I'm getting your name right, pronunciation. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Bindu. Um, so I'm Alan Arman. I'm in Seattle, Washington. I'm a data scientist with the target owned delivery service company, Shipt. Um, I'm in my fourth week at Shipt actually, so I'm, I'm pretty fresh here. At Shipt, I lead and manage a data science team responsible for predicting uh, the fulfillment time for different stages of our driven orders. Um, so shipped, you know, if you think of like Instacart, uh, DoorDash, uh, for shipped, you know, we have both shoppers and we have drivers. And what I'm responsible for is on the driven side and understanding how the different um, legs of that journey uh, work and how long does each one take. Um, before shipped, I previously worked at DocuSign in customer success operations, developing uh, recommendation engines um, and A-B testing systems. Expedia, I worked in ad technology, again, in experiment design and developing uh, machine learning models that helped optimize uh, the ad experience. And before then, uh, the majority of my career, which almost is like another life now, uh, was with the Federal Reserve conducting macroeconomics uh, and policy research. Welcome to Alan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Bindu and Abacus for the invitation. Uh, pleasure being with you, Alan, and Juan. So I'm Miguel Barez. I'm a VP of Data Science at uh, Albertsons, and I've been with Albertsons since October, so just recently. Uh, before that, I, um, I, I was in Peru working for uh, one of the largest conglomerates uh, with uh, 10 different industries within their portfolio, so banking, fishing, hospitality, mining, healthcare, insurance, etc. Um, just creating teams and creating value uh, with AI machine learning within the portfolio, so very much like a private equity fund and trying to just not do uh, value potential analysis and throw machine learning models at interesting uh, problems. Uh, had a lot of fun and then moved back to the States uh, just recently. Um, at Albertsons, we're basically trying to um, just create value for our customers through just machine learning, data science, and around the lines of personalization, around the lines of supply chain optimization, predicting out of stock, the usual things one does in, in retail. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xi Chen. Uh, I'm senior manager for the recommendation data science um, at Home Depot. Uh, so I have been with Home Depot for almost seven years um, in July, in June. Uh, so I have been working on recommendations since then uh, as an individual contributor. Now I'm uh, the senior manager on the team. Uh, and my team is responsible for the recommendation and the personalization algorithm that powers HomePeople.com. Uh, a lot of interesting work um, uh, happening in my group. Uh, I, I would like to share that uh, in the later panel discussions. Um, before I joined Home Depot, I was a um, senior um, engineer in, uh, at Qualcomm in California. I was um, uh, had the opportunity to play with deep learning very early on and uh, doing many uh, exciting research on computer vision uh, at Qualcomm. Uh, yeah, so that's my experience. Well, welcome everybody. Let's get started. I'm always excited to talk to practitioners. Uh, you know, it's one thing to talk to researchers, the other thing to talk to practitioners and practicing and applying machine and deep learning is always like, I would say, to, uh, you know, uh, is the hard, is the hard problem, right? Let's start actually with uh, 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 Zishuan. Uh, I know Home Depot is uh, one of those very, uh, I would say, um, strange unicorn-like companies in the sense that uh, you guys are applying deep learning in production. Uh, and you're doing it for what I think makes a lot of sense, right? Personalization and recommendation and search and stuff like that. Uh, I do the, uh, so I, we would love to hear about what got you started on that journey to the extent that you can share. Uh, why is it effective? Because, you know, generally amongst data scientists, deep learning has a bad name. I'm sure <laughs> you've heard that too, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, and why at least in these areas, it's, uh, you know, it, it could potentially be slam dunk to apply these techniques. 
Uh, yeah, a great question. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I, were, I was very fortunate uh, to be one of the first to play with Deep Learning. So, at, in uh, Qualcomm, uh, 2013, and I went to the NIPS 2013. That's where um, uh, I think uh, uh, Hinton was presenting the AlexNet work and uh, Yang Lacon was hired into Facebook and uh, Mark Zuckerberg was it appeared in NIPS trying to recruit uh, their scientists to Facebook. So um, yeah, so I was very lucky to play with Deep Learning, but I wasn't very sure Deep Learning can be used in enterprise uh, setting um, because it's very computational expensive. Uh, but luckily uh, Google published one paper about you know how YouTube used deep learning to uh, to power their recommendation. I was like, wow, uh, this this is gonna uh, this is gonna work. I mean, it works at a YouTube scale as gonna work at Home Depot scale as well. Um, yeah, then I I I, I look I uh, started look, uh, reading that paper and looking about relevant uh, technology can make it happen. Then I noticed that yes, there's a technology. It's, it's not, if you want to just do deep learning as it is, no, it's, gonna, it's not gonna scale. You have to do it in a smart way. There is the technology that enable deep learning uh, can be used in enterprise uh, in an affordable way, right? So this is from technology perspective, but from business, we always have, always have this need. Uh, at Home Depot, um, because when you have a use case that dealing with image and the text, and you want to understand the semantic meaning of the text, I think you probably, deep learning is the only option for you at, at this point to dealing with them, right? So it's um, a necessity. It's not just luxury to have, it's necessity. And it's very like Home Depot, like we have some use cases, we do need to understand the image and the uh, uh, text in order to uh, serve the better uh, recommendation for our customers, right? Uh, so yeah, we, we you it's deep learning just necessity. It's not a, a luxury or good to have. Um, the other uh, reason is uh, a better customer service. That's that's very uh, true to the heart to Home Depot. You know, Home Depot when, when Home Depot was a brick and mortar store. That's uh, Home Depot's uh, secret to be successful as well. The customer service in store. Uh, but in the e-commerce era, uh, how do you do customers online, right? So search recommendation, those digital uh, customer service. Uh, those are problems are hard. Like you're dealing with human problems, right? How, how do you serve uh, a, pe a person in an you know, intimate way, uh, right? Like uh, customer intact with Home Depot um, through different touch points, store, um, website, app, uh, right, the, the different channels, then have different interactions, talk to associates, you know, call to call center, click on a product, you know, purchase a product, uh, search some uh, words on your, uh, uh, on your website. Those interactions, so many types, and they are, their interactions are very nonlinear. How do you figure out, how do you distill signal, useful signal out of those multimodal complex interactions? I think probably today only deep learning is the only viable technology to do that. Uh, therefore, I think, yeah, yeah, deep learning is very yeah, useful to find people at this point. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh, what you're saying is it's going to be inevitable, probably like all every company everywhere is soon going to adopt it because there's no choice between language when I mean, you have language data or vision data. And it also is performant, right? In, in, yeah. in the cases of personalization and things like that, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's uh, kind of switch tracks a bit uh, and I'm um, like trying to actually really kind of go into your a uh, little bit into your backgrounds and like uh, ask questions which might be relevant. So let's go to Miguel. And I know Miguel was kind of leading up um, AIML at a very large bank in Latin. In America, he decided to come to the US and join Albertsons specifically. So Miguel, what made you decide on Albertsons? I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting that we have Home Depot and Albertsons, <laughs> similar but so different. So, uh, you know, uh, what attracted you to Albertsons? Huh? Yeah, uh, so I, first of all, I, I was excited to join a company that had a purpose that I could align to. So Albertsons purpose is to bring people together around the joys of food and to sp inspire well-being. And I really like that. Uh, purpose. And I think finding a company that you can align your purpose to is fundamental. 
because you really like will bring the most to it, right? And 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 you'll just find that you're working towards something. So I really like that. Um, the concept of well-being is something that's very important for me. Like, so the question of how can we uh, uh, promote and foster well-being for our customers, being a grocery chain, which we also have pharmacies, uh, that was really exciting. Second, uh, joining a company that is transforming itself and pushing to transform an industry. That was also very exciting. Um, Albertsons is investing heavily and has been investing heavily in technology and digital and customer centricity um, and data science. So just joining a company like that was super interesting. Um, and finally, I just was very excited to join a company whose uh, leadership team has both vision and ambition, like the, the ambition we have to transform ourselves and push uh, the boundaries of the industry are, are big. And that was something that I was very excited from the CEO of Vivek to Chris Ruff, Daniel Kropp, um, everyone there. Uh, in general, I like being a part of, of change. And while I was uh, at this uh, conglomerate in Peru for eight years and working on different industries and different in, uh, use cases, so not only banking, but insurance and all the different companies I mentioned, um, I was I never worked on retail. And it was very exciting to, to think about coming and joining a retail company because you have first party data and you can really get to know the customer well, right? So figuring out what people buy, what they consume, what they eat, that's like very, very um, a, a great way to really get to know our customers and be able to create and adapt our value proposition for them. So that was something else that was very interesting. Um, and, and I think uh, we do, I, I can probably share a couple of things we're doing um, um, in, the, in the context of what I mentioned of really getting to know our customers. Uh, one of the most important things I think is personalization, right? Because what is important for our customers varies. And so getting to know them, getting to understand their behaviors, their spending behaviors, what they eat, what they prefer, how often, et cetera. Um, that is super interesting. And we can really use machine learning for that to really personalize our offer, to understand those patterns. Uh, the other thing that we're working on and is aligned with our, our, our mission is how can we help our customers if they want so to live a healthier life? So how can we infer what their dietary preferences are? How can we help them plan their meals? How can we help them suggest what are products that could be more aligned with their objectives, right? So, so everything around nutrition and health and, and, and food uh, we're working on that, and we think we can really leverage our position and help our customers. Fantastic, fantastic. And Alan, you and Jishwan actually have been practitioners, uh, you know, quite recently. So you know kind of all the troubles uh, and the pains of data science. Uh, what do you think about uh, data science? Uh, and both of you moved to management, by the way. So my first question is, okay, so, you know, what made you uh, make that jump, A, and B, uh, you know, what are like the no, the highlights, lowlights of being a data scientist. Yeah, I, I can go first. So uh, in terms of what make, made me make that jump, um, I love helping people. I love, you know, uh, thinking about what is the strategic move we can make? How can we, uh, as managers, as leaders, prevent our direct reports from being as randomized and stressed? Um, how can we move forward in it as a team um, and, and drive business value? And, you know, I love being a practitioner too. Uh, I love getting my hands dirty. I love solving a problem. And, you know, going back and forth. And uh, I was actually a manager earlier in my career, too. Um, and I recently decided that I really just missed um, that more strategic leadership level uh, work. And luckily, I found a role uh, with Shift where I can, I can get my hands dirty and be a leader at the same time. Do you have any thoughts? Oh, sorry, um, pros and cons of data science, because you know, that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, um, you know, I'm, the, the, the pro is you can be up at midnight looking at the data and the con is you can be up at midnight looking at the data. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it's funny. I, I actually look at, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we do with our customers, uh, you know, I, 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 I enjoy it a lot, very honestly, because there's secrets in the data, right? Unlocking that could be interesting. So I couldn't agree more about looking at the data in the midnight, pro and con. Jishwan, what about you? Yeah, yeah, I think data science, uh, you know, I moved from individual contributor to manager doesn't mean manager is a better job than individual contributor. I think data science is a very good job. Uh, job, And also, I think doing machine learning in industry, I personally think it's more fun in, in, in academia uh, because uh, the problems are very fresh 
and, and very diverse, especially in, in retail e-commerce. Let's just, I, I would say this is the best arena to do this. And so it's the type problem, very diverse image, tax, uh, you know, uh, customer behavior, uh, conversation. So you name it, all, all kinds of like fraud. We also have fraud pro uh, problem as well. So it's just any type of problem we have it. Right. In the industry setting, not only the problem that were real, very fresh, but also we perform A-B tests. Right? In the A-B tests, you can see the incremental value your algorithm contribute to the organization, organization quantitatively. Right? How, how, how rewarding that can be, right? You, you, I think it's really hard, like in many jobs, you, 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 you maybe contribute to the organization, but you don't know how much. You don't know how much, but it, at home you hold, you know how much it is. We do A-B tests, very scientific way of, uh, to prove, uh, prove that, right? And also, um, and also it's, uh, it's about um, team collaboration. We have all, like, we have all kinds of, uh, oh, another thrill is just very simple. Like your algorithm is powering one experience. You can point to your friends, your family. I know how I know how this works. It's just very exciting. I I, I talk I, I talk this way to one of our uh, my candidates. I just show them, uh, show him the the the, the feature I, I I create in my on my website that that, that candidate we hire because nothing is more convincing than that, right? And another thing is the environment is very good. So we have all the you know um, engineers, product managers, user designers. Right, all work together to make a product, uh, you know, um, beautiful, useful to customers. Right, you you can learn other um, other professional as well. So it's just very rewarding experience for a data scientist working in industry in e-commerce in retail. So I, I I totally recommend this uh, job to everyone. Um, manager is uh, is different. Is um, I felt like it's it's really good job and uh, data science job and they can play a huge impact to uh, organization but uh, if i just work as an individual contributor maybe i can develop myself or grow myself 10 percent more each year but that's just 10 percent more right but if i i can lead a team i can lead you know tens of people i can multiplex myself uh to that level i i, I can multiplex my impact to the company, to the society, you know, 10 times, right? So um, right now I'm a manager, manager, right? So you can see that that impact can, can go exponentially. So I also do recommend a manager jobs in data science as well. Uh, but I just want to summarize one, one sentence is, I think uh, finding a, a little, I have to speak about our challenge now. Finding a good data scientist can make real world impact is challenging in this job market. But I, I would also say- Couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, I, I would also argue like finding a good data science manager is even harder, yeah. uh, right? Uh, so uh, I, I just totally recommend both jobs, but uh, uh, I, I probably encourage more people to become manager of data science to educate and culture uh, more data science uh, that can uh, play bigger impact. Yeah. Okay. Pros and cons of data science. Sorry, I asked two questions in one shot. <laughs> uh, yeah. Pro, I I haven't seen a con. You haven't seen a con. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that. It's just a very exciting every day. Um, haven't had time to think about what's bad about it. Uh, okay. And uh, home people has very good uh, work uh, life balance, right? So. Um, you do take care of your family. It's not like <laughs> you're okay. uh, very, very it. stressful. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's change tack a bit. I was hoping that you guys would say one of the big cons is how long it takes to like actually build good systems and models. I was like, okay, please set me up. But having, a, <laughs> having a, you know, saying myself that like some of the issues I see as a data scientist, because I do a lot of practicing myself, I agree with Alan. One of it is like data wrangling. The other, of course, is it takes I think quite a long time to put models in production. So Miguel, I'd like to hear about what your experiences have been so far in terms of like, you know, what's like time to production. It feels like if you're a software engineer or if you're a software engineering manager, right? You, you can give somebody like um, a sprint or like two sprints and say, okay, this can get done. And if you're a good software engineer manager, you know who your team is, you know, in those two sprints, things will get done. 
But machine learning, I don't know, it's like a coin toss almost, feels like that. So what do you think? Huh? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, Mindu. Uh, so I, I think the biggest problem for data science is how do you create value? How do you go from models to actual business value? And, and, and between both things, there's this thing, which is like what you're saying, like what are, the, what are the ways which we bring that to reality? And it's like the data wrangling, but then it's putting into production. The putting into production, I think is very hard because um, this is a fairly new field in terms of like scaling it, right? So I, there's a ton of people doing models and there have been many years of people doing models. The question is, how do we find a way of scaling it? If, if we find ways of scaling, I think here's where the opportunity for platforms come in. One can really like, um, and, and like Shishuan said, like one can really multiply the effect yeah. of one's team and one can have a smaller team, medium team, whatever, but one can really get the value across the whole organization. So I think the objective is how do you provide AI as a service within your organizations, right? And, and move from a, mo uh, from a piecemeal model production or model development and deployment of models to like establishing and creating products and services. You can't do that without a platform. And, um, and that's actually something that is, is probably our, our, the biggest area of interest right now for companies like Albertsons and others. And we're right now we're thinking of that. We're thinking of architecture. We're deploying, like we're talking to different people and we're just trying to figure out what is the correct way for us that we can actually get these things we're developing, the modeling into the hands of the users. And many times, you don't want to put them, you definitely don't want to put the models. Many times you don't want the users to even know there's a machine learning or AI model. You just want to incorporate what you're doing into the decision-making process, right? And, or replace their decision-making process because there's less uncertainty. So you just want to automate things, right? So, so that they can do other stuff. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so, uh, you know, to uh, Jishwan, you said there are no cons, which I think is uh, is a way of saying you loved your job, which is great. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you got, uh, to the extent, again, you, you can share, like, how did you set this up? You guys obviously do a lot of models. You, ha you have this at scale working quite well. What can you share? Because I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience who want to be as productive maybe as Home Depot has been. And then you also do research, right? I mean, you've got a few papers out there. So tell us more. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, I say no con doesn't mean there's no pain points in data science life, uh, like data wrangling is, uh, yeah. but uh, but what do you do about it, right? People talk about data science spend 80% of time in data cleaning, Yeah. but then what do they will do? Like do you accept that, right? So, so thank you for the opportunity for me to talk about data leadership in data science. I encourage people to uh, take more leadership uh, uh, roles in data science to push the field further. So we, when we heard about 80% of data wrangling, uh, that's true, but that's for a new use case, right? Okay. For, right. But uh, we, because of that, we established a platform team within data science team, right? We were trying to make, uh, change that. Uh, for the first data science, look at the first uh, new use case. Yeah, it's true, 80% of the time. But if another data science also look at the same, similar use case, yeah can that data science really use the existing work, right? If you don't allow that happen, yeah, everybody 80% of the time. But if you can't allow people to reuse, then it's not 80% of the time, right? That's when we talk about leadership in data science. When you see some uh, uh, pain points in your everyday life job, mm -hmm. can you change that? It's not like uh, accept it, can you change it? So the next generation data science, they will not suffer this, right? Um, so yeah, so we, we do have platform in the team very early on. This is before machine learning ops. It's, it's not because we're smart, it's just we, we, don't, we cannot bear the, 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 the pain in our uh, job. So we, we create that uh, organization. So platforms are essential. Alan, uh, what about you? New company shipped, is that also a platform friendly company? Yeah, I, I would say we're very big on uh, building out internal platforms from what I can see so far. Um, there's a lot of, you know, massive ambition uh, in terms of tooling, um, both actually both internal and external. Um, and, you know, to kind of echo the point about the 80-20, it's not, you know, from my own experience, it's not just new use cases, it's also new hires, 
Um, if we all kind of think about our experience as being new hires, especially on the practitioner side, and we're going through a new project, um, our time is often consumed by simply trying to understand what the data even means. Uh, we go through so much documentation if there's if we're lucky enough to have documentation. Uh, we probably Slack message people we don't even know across the company asking, what is this field? Where is it coming from? What is the business context for it? And then we spend time looking through data warehouse source code too to really understand uh, the how that how that field is populating. Um, and so, I mean, there's just so much time there on the data discovery side that I think we spend as new hires and 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 then into new use cases. Um, and there's so much room, I think, across the industry to close that gap uh, with platform type technologies. And I think um, for an ML platform, especially on like the just before model development or at the model development stage, uh, there's a big opportunity there to help surface data issues uh, to the user. Um, like showing the distributions for every feature or saying, hey, maybe there's data leakage going on yeah. that you don't know about. My top feature right now. I mean, of course, uh, I mean, I think most people in the audience probably know uh, this is, of course, from Advocacy AI. We are a machine learning platform. But whenever I talk to, uh, I mean, what I've seen, and I, I just give you like a quite, uh, you know, the backdrop or the background here. Uh, when we first started, very many, pe very many people were convinced that they don't even need a platform. They should just basically build notebooks, go and like Dockerize these notebooks, and that's that, right? Now I think pretty much everyone is convinced that there needs to be some sharing, some infrastructure some platform and then uh, I will just uh, mention to you recently uh, I had a chat with uh, Dropbox uh, and Dropbox is very well known this is public uh, they don't even use the cloud not because they're not tech forward or something uh, they went to the cloud and then they turned off cloud because it was much more expensive for them to use AWS than not and now guess what they've written their own data warehouse as well they don't even use Snowflake or BigQuery or anything. So my question is around build and buy. In the ML platform space today, I see quite a few people going you know, in one direction and I think a significant number going in the other, meaning there is no winning direction here, right? Yet, it feels like. A lot of people are building in-house, some people are choosing to buy. Uh, what do you think? I mean, how do you think this will allow, uh, evolve? Let's start with Miguel on this, like, you know, you. You know, how do you think it is? I mean, am I summarizing that correctly today? And then, you know, what's the future going to look like? Yeah, no, I totally, uh, I think you're summarizing correctly. I, and I think it's really dependent on the baseline of the different companies, right? And the, the capabilities they have. Um, and I think it, many times it has to do with time to value. Like some companies like could develop it internally, but they, the time to value of acquiring a part of a platform, because I think the ecosystem around or the platform, the conceptual framework of, ML ops and in general, uh, what you need to really deploy ML and AI is big, has different far, parts, right? Um, and I think one has to be smart and figure out what parts could be developed internally, what parts could be outsourced, what parts can be outsourced and then uh, brought in internally. And I think it's it's uh, it's a time to value question. Um, so we're, we're looking at it like that way. We're looking at what we can do internally, but we are probably going to be heavy, be uh, heavily dependent on partners just because we believe that, um, at least in the beginning, a lot of, of what's out there can really help us, uh, change what we're doing now. And we need to move quickly because in the end, the, like the customer needs certain things that we can't necessarily provide. So therefore that's why we need to move quickly. And the question will be then how much are we spending and the alternative of doing it internally, what's the benefit, what's the cost, um, the, the cost benefit of doing that uh, versus working on some other value uh, opportunity. I think that that's, that's kind of like the framework we have at least. Makes sense to me. Alan and Jishwan, how, how do you guys think about it? Yeah, you know, I think the question in terms of build versus buy also goes back to customer versus user, right? The, cu the customer, right? The business leadership, operational leadership, the user, data scientist um, and the business and operational leadership, you know, they think of low code or no code solutions that deliver on business dates quickly um, without necessarily like, you know, scaling to so many data scientists or to so many engineers to support that. And then, you know, it also reflects on the customer side, data scientists who want cutting edge tools to accelerate uh, their work, uh, such as the infrastructure work workload, um, but still allows them to get their hands dirty and feel like they're being technical. Um, and frankly, like there are some data scientists that I know that very much prefer to build everything from scratch, but um, 
you know, I'm starting to see a shift in mentality. How many practitioners use sklearn and don't write the underlying code for random forest themselves, right? Um, there's a reason these tools are useful. Um, and at their best, they allow the data scientists to focus on the cognitive non-routine work, the art of crafting that model. At their worst though, these tools, um, they may be workhorse tools and libraries, but they can sometimes make us fly blindly um, if we don't have a strong theoretical foundation. And so, you know, more and more, um, I think data scientists are going to have to realize that conducting data science research doesn't necessarily mean that you wrote any of the code for their algorithm yourself, but it does mean that you know how to use the tools and not misuse them. And on the flip side, on the, on the business side, um, you know, the business leadership needs to know that in order for this tool to be used well, it has to be a data scientist at the steering wheel. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Sheikhi. Yeah, so uh, my thought on this, uh, first of all, yeah, I agree is, uh, you know, uh, speed to market is uh, the most important thing. Um, but it doesn't mean, you know, uh, buying from vendor is the the way to uh, you know, uh, shorten the speed to market. Because, you know, uh, sometimes vendor can be slow as well, right? <laughs> for certain, certain, uh, certain, certain things, right? So, so right. Uh, so, so it's uh, in-house and the vendors. That, that's why uh, both uh, both methods are used by each company, uh, because the, the, each company trying to speed uh, the, the speed to market, shorten the speed to market. That, that's why com different company choose: should I use vendor faster or in-house faster? Right? So I think uh, um, this has been uh, talked about. But I want to talk about two other aspect. Is I think this is very healthy. Phenomenon, right? That means you know, you know, AI is uh, is bring value to a society. Therefore, everyone want to contribute to it. There are different solutions. Uh, that's great. A very healthy phenomenon. Um, another point I want to bring up is actually, I think data science is very still not mature uh, profession. Uh, we we don't know what we need eventually. Uh, so that there's some involvement uh, down the road. Uh, right now, we focus on might not be the, the, the we need in the future. So there's a little bit of uncertainty on that as well. So that's also cause you know in-house uh, vendor and different vendor solution, uh, etc. I know that makes a lot of sense. I think the uh, just generally AIML is very much in its infancy. I think almost everybody agrees. And then the data science too has like, is kind of like trying to figure things out. And therefore you have all these different tool sets and people are like, oh, should I build, take get on a whole platform? Should I get like, you know, what layer of abstraction and so on? So at least we are all agreeing that we do need shared infrastructure, which is a good sign. And now the question becomes like, what does that look like? And that's early on. Uh, and it's early on in its evolution. That all makes sense to me. So so I mean, let's talk a little bit more about the platform versus uh, kind of like, um, you know, we're, we're basically having this build versus buy debate, uh, which I think uh, is a good one to have. But one of the things I have, uh, you know, at least experienced, at least from, you know, kind of my, uh, I, I used to uh, work at Google and Google, as you can imagine, is just a build, build, build company. <laughs> there is no buying, right? And then if you look at Netflix, uh, it's actually a much more modern company in some ways. Uh, and they're a lot more like a buy, buy, buy company, weirdly, right? I mean, they they built everything on um, AWS, and so um, so I, I do think the DNA uh, of, of each organization is different, and that makes sense. Uh, I guess the question for all of you guys, because at some level, all of you are data science managers, right? Uh, so the question is, why uh, there's so many people right now, like trying to adopt and learn and become data scientists, yet. I think everybody here, at least maybe there's somebody here who's disagreeing with me, but let me know, agrees that it's super difficult to find a good data scientist, right? How do we, like, why is that? Why are good data scientists hard to find? Uh, and, you know, how will the world solve the problem? Is it going to be tooling? Is it going to be AGI? Or is it going to be that we'll end up having really good data scientists in the future? Let's uh, go around the room, I guess. Uh, maybe, Miguel, you can start us off. Sure. I, I think... I would take a step back and ask, what is a good data scientist? And I think what is a good data scientist is, is, is dependent on where that data science needs to be, right? Like a good data scientist is probably different at Google, at Facebook, at Albertsons, et cetera, right? I think there's different dimensions of, of where one is good technically in terms of soft skills, in terms of like the, the, the values and character they have, the, uh, the purpose they have, et cetera. For us, like what we're looking for is data scientists who obviously the minimum, uh, like there's necessary conditions and there's sufficient conditions, right? Necessary for sure. You want people who are really good technically speaking, correct? But then you want, like, I think many times data scientists are not good data scientists, not because they're not good technically, 
just be, but just because they have not learned or they don't like to work in teams, I'm not generalizing, um, and or they don't necessarily see the importance of value and time to value, right? So, so in their objective function, that's not there yet because they're very focused on um, just like optimizing and getting that extra AUC or precision or whatever. So let's if, if, if I say that a good data scientist has all the qualities that we as a company want, I would say it's so hard just because there's, it's such a hot market. There's such a need for talent. And, and I think that just requires organizations to really understand what it is they need and how do you search for them? Now, once you bring them in, um, the question is how do you enable them to create the most value? And I think that's where that's where having tools that you can independently of in-house, out-house, like whatever, like having tools that they can use, kind of like Jarvis, kind of like Iron Man, like uh, like what are the suits and the tools that you can give them to really multiply what they're doing and scale it and have these network effects within the organization. Okay, yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, is it Sean or Alan? I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm having like an echo. If I am, I'm going to be. Yeah, I think I heard a little something, but uh, yeah, I can go next. You know, I think one reason uh, it's you know very difficult to hire, you know, to say quote unquote good data scientists is uh, the fact that even with a strong academic background, you still need a lot of years of experience to go through different projects. I think as Miguel was getting at going through and getting that business sense uh, for how to interact with stakeholders, how to communicate your results effectively to both technical and non-technical audiences. Um, and financial investment, they have a formula uh, that relates to you know, what a financial investor uh, can achieve or like how, how talented they are. And it's a function of the square root of how many projects they've managed, how many investments they've gone through. Um, and the same is kind of true across other fields too, like data science. You need more and more projects under your belt to understand what you learn in academia and how it applies um, and what, you know, what sort of nuance has come up in the real world. Um, and, and that's so hard to get just, you know, um, and having, having somebody come in uh, with that background is invaluable. Having them know how to look for those nuances uh, for those, you know, for those mistakes in the data, as we talked about, like data discovery, that requires maturity, a big, a big level of maturity to do right. Um, yeah, so uh, from me, I think uh, uh, I have three points. First of all, like data science is hard because what you do is trying to use the algorithmistic way you are to change the world, right? You're trying to make business impact in a certain area, right? It's hard. Like making a real impact is hard in general, no matter data science or whatever, it's just hard. Uh, therefore, the, the bar for the, the the talent is high. So therefore, it's it's just really hard to find good talent can solve um, pretty uh, real world problem in certain domain, right? So that's one aspect. The second aspect is uh, the data science, um, uh, and also it's probably uh, data science. You know, today it's not like data science is Superman can do anything. Usually, it's you need to work in in a team to make things happen, right? So, therefore, the you know th this is not necessarily taught in school. There's no such environment for for student to be in, immersed in that environment. Like, how do you work with totally different thing? Like UX research, usually they from our school or something. It's just, it's not, not uh, intact with your your student life, right? So that's also make it tough. Uh, the third point is probably uh, from industry as well. Uh, there is a barrier between academia and the industry. The, the, the industry has certain problem, but uh, for various reasons, they don't want to disclose their problem. Therefore, academia don't don't receive those problems solved. So academia, is, they they can't find their own problem to teach their student, which is not necessarily align with what the industry need. Right. So there's a gap there. As well, so I'm also working on uh, effort. Uh, extra next week is uh, uh, to talk with some university uh, people to how to uh, establish the relationship between uh, make bring the gap to get smaller. Right? How how do we uh, co-educate a student? How do we increase uh, research collaboration with universities? Uh, yeah, I think that's the, another piece. Um, uh, could, could, could contribute to this um, phenomenon. Problem, yeah, no, makes sense. I mean, what you're saying is data science is hard. 
the academic programs aren't really like equipping, equipping them for real life problems. Uh, and so, and then in, the, in general, that just uh, makes the whole uh, problem much more difficult. Uh, so let's get a little bit more kind of like uh, into uh, like the kinds of problems you guys are solving in your organizations. Like the, com I mean, I like calling them common enterprise AI use cases. Maybe common, it may be specific to you. Uh, and I think a lot of people talk about like, you know, when you look at uh, the AI community, we're all talking about like, uh, NLP and vision and whatnot, but then real world problems, a lot of times I've seen at least have to do a lot with like structured data, right? Churn reduction, huge benefit to the company. Uh, personalization, super huge benefit. So um, I, I think for each of you, like what are your five top AI applications? If there are not five, you can go with whatever number you've got. Um, in, in your organization or in the past, which you think will be kind of the big move Movers and shakers in terms of the bottom line. Uh, Miguel? Sure. Uh, so Maybe this time we go Miguel, Zishan, and Alan. Change it up. <laughs> so um, I, I think all across the uh, uh, customer relationship uh, journey, right? So acquisition, um, correct risk or pricing. Uh, so so how do you, where do you find your clients or customers? Like how do you price correctly if you have a service or like product? Uh, how do you uh, um, increase wallet share? Like, how do you create more value for them so that they will give you more money? Um, how do you retain them? And and I think uh, if some leave, how do you win back? Those are kind of like the the five that we have, uh, and I've, I've had in the past as well. Like, just like how do we just get our customers, make sure they don't leave? And then there's like other stuff around like uh, customer service, right? How do we use NLP and vision and like. Uh, uh, audio how do we really learn what our customers pains are and what are we what are the pains we're generating on them in terms of customer service and how do we really mine that space to be able to really change our offering for them uh yeah so for me i think i think personally i think you know i haven't seen a like a industry area that any area like doesn't need revamp or re, re redesigned by by AI or machine learning. I think is generally, I haven't seen a case uh, AI or machine learning doesn't apply. So that's the first thing, right? Second is, I think it's different uh, area, the enterprise has different priority, right? You 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 probably more certain area more, more important for you. Uh, so for Home Depot, I think, uh, you know, research implementation where I think digital customer service, that's very important, right? In store, you have a social that can help customers, but the online with a two-dimensional screen, how can you do a customer service? I think right now it's you know search recommendation, uh, personalization. Those are the two uh, approach we use to do digital customer service. Uh, then beyond that, marketing, right? There's always information gap between people, p two people, company to brand to people, right? And how do you bring that gap, uh, uh, information gap? That's also important. A supply chain, right? Like how do you use the most efficient way to um, distribute um, goods or resources to the society, right? Very, very important topic as well. Um, and also, um, uh, and also like uh, for Home Depot, like in-store environment, you know, how do you lay out the store uh, how do you uh, serve customer better in the that store environment? And also human management. You know, you have limited uh, associate in each store. How can you allocate the resources so that the customer can feel they have more support from associate, right? So that's also important. And uh, many other areas, I think it can be used AI and machine learning, but those are five I, I can talk about. Got it, Alan? Yeah, you know, I think some great use cases have already been covered. One one that comes to my mind that hasn't been mentioned is next best action. Uh, so if you're thinking about you know enterprise, uh, you know especially like B two B or SaaS, uh, knowing what's the next best action to take that's going to optimize the likelihood of retention or the likelihood of upsell. That's that's going to be so important. It already is important. Um, you know, for those of you on the call that you know don't. Uh, haven't thought much about next best action. It's really like, what, what action can I take with the customer? Send them an email, call them, anything in your action space that will increase the likelihood of conversion and retention. Um, and I think one big issue that's being faced right now by the industry is how you prevent that next 
best action engine from being siloed within a specific division. So if you think about like customer support, right? They can take an action uh, based off a customer support ticket. If you think about adoption and marketing, they might send an email to drive adoption. Uh, the big risk with siloing is that they might both decide to take the same action with the customer and a customer gets duplicate emails about the same matter. Um, so it's really important in the orchestration not to be siloed. It's also important in the model estimation stage not to be siloed too and, and include a more comprehensive action and event space. Perfect. Okay, lots of really great applications. We need a platform. All sounds reasonable. <laughs> so but, let's. Uh, but, 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 oh? I, I just really, I, what Alan said is saying, I think is super important. And I think the, okay. if you have a platform, that's like it de-risks if you if the organization is working on a platform basically you will prevent silos that's the idea right. of having a platform right, right. So great, great insight no that, that, i totally agree uh, and i think uh, the tools have catching up to do but i think we'll be getting there i think let's go to a couple of audience questions because i think this one seems like a really interesting one which i've wondered about as well uh, a question in the build versus buy debate how much do you think system level technical debt plays a role? Does it flip the decision to buy? Uh, you know, I, I think this is kind of really real, right? I mean, if you're inside an organization, you you go off and build something, you're like, oh, I'm very excited, I'm building something new. Uh, and then once it's built, there is the maintaining, there is the UI, there is the catching of bugs, you know, it goes on and on. So, I mean, how do you, how do you look at technical debt today? Anyone want to take the question? Oh. So I'll, I'll talk about my previous experience. Like technical dev is like the skeletons in the closet, right? It's like this thing, like nobody wants to talk about and like we just push back and but it's so real. Um, and I do think it is, a, a, I think it's, an, it's underestimated and many times not really uh, risk assessed when one is thinking of uh, build versus buy. And I think sometimes uh, the, if companies have had a really bad experience building systems and technology that technical debt is kind of like this this uh it's in the background and many times will influence their decision of what to do right got it um let's see if there's anything else yeah i would just add to that real quick okay, sure. it's not only on the infrastructure side that there's technical debt it's on the modeling side too and it's going to be pretty hard to divorce that technical debt from the data scientist team. But with a platform, with an ML platform and tooling, you can really reduce the scope of it. And you can enable much quicker action with much less effort to address technical debt that comes up with the model specifically too. Got it. Let's see. There's one interesting question here. Isn't I am doing my master's in machine learning. It's great to hear from you guys. One of my biggest quandaries is how much our work is model researching versus using out of the box models. What should as a student, what should the students focus on the most? I think this is actually a rel I mean, I think if you broaden that question out, it is kind of talking to, uh, speaking to what Jishwan just said, hey, like the academic programs are not kind of really up to speed in terms of real world problems. So what should students do, right? What, what, what are your like suggestions for them? Because uh, I'm sure if, you know, if they could use real world data sets, they would, but short of like collaborating with Home Depot or Albertsons, which frankly speaking is very hard to do, uh, any ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't have answers. I'm trying to figure that out as well. It's just a very challenging problem. Uh, I think uh, my suggestion based on side, uh, current situation is intern, right? Find you know, <laughs> uh, intern. That's right? a good idea, yeah. Uh, go to a certain company and intern and get a real uh, feel of uh, that particular domain. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, and and also just uh, do more like a uh, cable competition. It's uh, you know, all kinds of a, pro a problem over there. Uh, practice more, um, do more, yeah. And learn from learn from the best people. Like uh, oh, oh, another oh, great idea is go to data science conference. <laughs> I I am <laughs> telling people don't don't have like just search on Google top data science conference and go to those conference. I think this is one of benefit from COVID. Is you know all, all the data science conference become virtual or, or at least have a virtual option. Well, the ticket is 100, 200 bucks. Right? Go there and uh, listen to the best in the industry, what they are working on, what their challenge. I think this is very direct, very very effective and cost effective way of uh, learning. Uh, learn uh, be be more uh, prepared for industry jobs. 
Yeah, I think there are kind of two parts to this question for the out of the box versus the researching. Um, yeah, you know, the more the more and more you progress in your career, you're probably going to start saying this out of the box model is going to do the trick. It's going to lead to a good V0 or V1. Um, and then as we see business value from that first iteration, we can go through additional cycles. That's what you start to see more and more. In terms of uh, you know, how you can ramp up and become more experienced, one, one great um, experience that I had early in my career was going to meetups. Uh, there are some meetups where people get together for a couple hours, 20, 30 uh, aspiring data scientists and tackle problems. Um, one problem that, the, that I did that I loved was uh, how to how to optimize routes for a local transportation uh, public transportation system um, that kind of those kinds of problems are so edifying you do code reviews with people it's really like uh, that team experience that people were talking about earlier that's an important uh, part of maturing as a data scientist is working on teams and going to meetups and having that kind of experience is great okay fantastic any parting thoughts we're a little over time but uh, any parting thoughts to our audiences in terms of like uh, uh, in terms of like advice to them, what to do, build versus buy. Mine is very simple, use Abacus AI, but what's yours? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, one concluding thought is, you know, about the benefit of ML platforms like Abacus. Uh, one big thing that you encounter is confirmation bias, right? As we go through model development, we all want the model to do well. Um, and you also see a lot of varied practices for model evaluation across different data scientists. Um, and one, one wonderful thing about platforms like Abacus is that you can start to align on standard practices, best practices, and it's a forcing function for team members to apply them and manage a common, uh, a common approach to evaluating models and take some of that confirmation bias out of it. I, I, I would just add, I think one of the benefits of, of, of options like, uh, like you guys can do is like the knowledge you guys bring. And, and, and other vendors, like in general, I think the experience, the knowledge just creates a lot of time to value. I would say to the audience, like uh, put the burden on uh, the partner, right? Because like you guys are eager and, and you guys have been really good with us, like trying to do POCs and really demonstrate with data, being very data driven, like we can actually help you create more value. So I'd say like put the burden on the, on the partner, have show like do a POC, just look at the data do an experiment and just figure out are we really going to create more value with this versus not i think that's that's probably one of the best ways to approach things experiment yeah that sounds great any parting thought Jishwan, or yeah yes so uh, i think uh, we're we're a little bit biased we're all everybody come from industry and i uh, was very uh promote you know industry uh, data science job probably i uh, will <laughs> say some same nice uh, academia <laughs> as well so so like there, there are many professors they are really great great right. yeah they, they see a problem very deeply so they are solving some very fundamental problem in ai and the machine learning we, i really appreciate their research i know you know i'm working with many of them uh to help uh help my organization to uh to make machine learning approach more practical most robust is actual. So if you have that um, um, inspiration, want to pursue your PhD, find a good uh, PhD advisor, uh, pursue your academia, it will be very fruitful to you as well. Uh, but then for um, uh, for industry data science job, you know, I just felt uh, personally I like it a lot uh, because you can make it really really world impact uh, problem very diverse. I, I I would highly encourage you to do uh, data science practitioner in industry. Uh, the final thing is data science leadership. You know, I would say. AI is very naive and data science is very naive at this point. Uh, I, I think uh, everybody should take the data science leadership role to make this field more robust, um, theoretically, practically, uh, you know, uh, ethically, every aspect, uh, yeah, please help to make this domain, uh, this professional real, uh, data science professional uh, real. Okay.